Happy Labor Day. Thank you for all your hard work throughout the year. I think tomorrow's the day that we celebrate you for working and we take a rest from our labors. So I'm done here today. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you being here. It's my day off, so thank you. All right. Band? No, they're not here. Okay, so actually the funny part about that is that today we are actually going to do a lot of work. In fact, it might even feel like you're back in a college lecture room, okay? So I apologize, particularly if you went to schools like University of Washington, like I did, where the lecture halls were very big and it's very easy to fall asleep. I do not want you to fall asleep, but today we're actually not doing something uh, normal. We're actually starting a little four-week mini-series that's going to be different than how we preach throughout the rest of the year. So if you're new with us and you're like, wow, these folks... Uh, don't talk about the Bible a lot. Trust me, we do, and we'll be back into our regular uh, way, which is, is like 90% of the year where we're preaching passage by passage through books of the Bible. We will be starting on September 30th, the second half of the book of Acts. In the spring, we did the first half of the book of Acts, which accounts uh, the beginning of the Jesus movement, and so we'll get to do the second part of the book of Acts starting September 30th, okay? Uh, but for this four weeks, we're doing... Our annual series, we do this every year, on how to have better conversations. Now, here's the reason uh, why we do an annual series every year on how to have better, bigger conversations. The logic goes like this. First, we believe that our mission as a church is to help people consider Jesus. It's that simple. And our vision is that we would stir up in the city of Seattle a deep, meaningful, authentic consideration of the person and work and gospel of Jesus Christ amongst all people. This is a big vision, right? But that's our vision, that the entire city would find themselves considering anew or for the first time the person of Jesus Christ. So how does this happen? Well, the way this happens is that people actually begin to consider everything. They consider the biggest questions that life has to offer, questions about meaning and purpose, questions about value. And as they're considering all the biggest questions that this life has to offer, that what they realize is that all the answers that they've been provided or the world provides fall short fall short of a true, deep expression of life that they so long. And when it falls short, our hope is to be there with them, asking them, have you considered Jesus? In all your consideration, have you considered the gospel of Jesus Christ? And we believe that when the gospel of Jesus Christ is considered along with everything else, that it will rise to the top because it is true, and it will show itself to be the only way of explaining and making sense of the beauty and the brokenness of the world, along with the beautiful brokenness of us as individuals, people filled with this crazy combination of good and evil, and it's the only thing that actually makes this life existentially livable in and out of every season. We are so confident that that is true if people, in their consideration of the deep things, consider to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how does this process of consideration that leads people to redemption, new life, joy, happiness, fulfillment, purpose. How does this begin? Now some might say it's my job to stand up here and preach great sermons. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. One, I'm, I'm not good enough. <laughs> Two, Think of how many people live in this city. And even if every church in this city is full of people every Sunday morning, there's not enough space. 
the way this process begins is by each and every one of us sitting in this room learning to have bigger and better and fuller and deeper conversation with those people to whom we have access. That is the way people find life. And we are deeply committed to this at Sedaris. It's why we do the four-minute conversation. It's why we push fellowship groups so hard. This is where rubber meets the road, but that's not enough even. Each and every one of us has to be all the time about all sorts of things having bigger, better conversation. And through that, what will naturally happen is the gospel of Jesus Christ will begin to bubble up and the world will see that's true. Okay? So that's why we break every year and we do a short mini-series on how to have better conversations. And, 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 and here's what we've noticed. For those people that have been around Sedaris for a while, uh, we're only three and a half years old as a church, but I always ask people who have been around for a while and have heard me beat this drum again and again, I always ask them, I say, hey, how's it going? Are you having better, bigger conversations? This is the two answers I always get from every person. Uh, they say this. One, not actually. I'm not actually having the kinds of conversations that I wish I had. But the other thing they always say is, but I'm hyper aware that I'm not having the kinds of conversations I wish I could have. To me, that's a win. That's a win because where they were and where they are now, where they were is apathetic, unaware, where they are now is longing and striving to do this mission well. And it also tells me this, we're just gonna keep beating this drum. Better conversations, bigger conversations, each and every one of us learning to have bigger, better conversations. And two, it tells me this is really hard. It's really hard to have great conversation. It is not something that's coming natural to us. It's not something that's natural to the people of our city. And so we need to continue to train and teach and encourage each other how to do this well, okay? So that brings us back to this annual sermon series. And uh, what you're gonna notice is that this year in particular, uh, it's gonna feel a little bit more educational. It's gonna feel a little, sometimes maybe even like a fire hose. We're gonna try to give you some practical skills about how do you do this. And the goal is always at the end of these that you would understand people better. The people that you're having conversation with, that you understand what drives them, what motivates them, how they're seeing the world. And this in turn will help you to understand how to listen well. Because the problem is, is if we don't understand people, how do we listen well? We need to become interpreters of language so that when people talk to us, we can understand what they're actually saying. Uh, what I found is the more I press into how do I understand people better, I actually understand what they're saying better than they do. We'll see how that works a little bit today. We need to understand, hopefully at the end of this, we'll understand how to ask really good questions. And then hopefully we'll have the confidence to be courageous and to sit in conversation. Because see, this is what happens all the time to me and probably to you as well. The conversation begins to get serious. Maybe even God comes up Maybe even Jesus comes up, and we, out of love for our friends, want to take a step back to protect them because we know the implications of where this conversation's going. And so we are actually the ones that pull the plug, that hit the eject button, that skirt the issue. When I think many of the people we're talking to, they want to sit in these challenging topics with us. So we need to, to hopefully be courageous to understand and in some ways, uh, one of my favorite professors always say to outthink the world for Christ, meaning that we've put in work to understand the way things are, the way people think out of love for them so that we might stay in those conversations. So in 2015, our first uh, summer as a church, we did a, a series called The Universe Next Door where we looked at other worldviews, other religions and worldviews, and we just sought to understand. And you can look at all these online or through the app. You can go and see these sermon series if, if this kind of stuff's interesting to you. The next year, we did The Art of Conversation. How do we actually uh, artfully do conversation? The next year we did the art of neighboring. What does it mean to be a good neighbor and start relationships and conversations with those who live uh, near us? 
Uh, and then this year, we're doing a series called The Habits of the Heart. And it's based upon this book here, uh, which is a bestseller, national bestseller. It says so right there. National bestseller. But it is an impactful book. It's not a Christian book. It's a book of sociology uh, written by a bunch of smart guys and gals from around uh, the country, uh, many of which who are psychologists, sociologists, and philosophers. And uh, they put this book together to try to explain uh, what they call the habits of the heart of the American individual, okay? I hope today, today, so today is primarily like an intro, kind of like core syllabus, okay? <laughs> so uh, it's going, I'm not going to get us all the way there. It's just a teaser, you got to come back. Uh, but I'm going to set up the problem for us today, the problem that we often face in our society. And then I'm going to try to answer why it's important, why this topic, understanding this topic is important to actually having better conversations. And you're going to have to stick with me. You, we might be going along, you're like, I don't see where this is going. And in fact, maybe it won't even click in till 10 years from now, and you're like, oh my gosh, that stuff is so true. But we just don't want to give you platitudes, we don't want to just give you like, you know, five steps to being a better husband or anything like this, not that those things are wrong, but we believe if you understand what we're going to talk about in this series, you will be a better husband, you will be a better friend, you will be a better coworker. And it might not be apparent up front, but we trust that you guys are thinking, considering deep individuals, and so we're going to give you the raw, hard data, okay? You guys ready for this? I feel like we need to pray, because I just set up a gauntlet, okay? Let's pray real quick and ask God uh, to fill us with his spirit. Oh, Heavenly Father, we need you here. We, we hope that this is what you want us to do. We believe you want us to enter into these kinds of joint education and training that we might fulfill your mission that you've called us to in this city better. We want to be effective vehicles of your grace where we live, in the circles of influence in which we exist. We, out of love for people and a love for you, want to have great conversation. We want to bring life to people. We want to be outlets for people to have the kinds of conversations that they long for deep in their soul. Help us to become those kinds of people. Help this sermon series uh, to be helpful towards that end. God, it is your son, Jesus Christ, who has died for us and who has risen from the grave. He is the reason that we stand here today. Help us never forget that. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay. To begin to answer the question of why this topic that we're about to study is important, I need to tell you two stories about two Evanger men. That's my last name. Two Evanger men. There's an old Evanger man and there's a young Evanger man. Uh, the first story I'll tell is about the old Evanger man. The old Evanger man, when he was five years old, that's me, by the way, I'm the old version, um, walked into uh, his church's bathroom when he was about five or six years old, hard to remember. He walked into the bathroom, and, and he walked in the bathroom, and, and uh, here's the door to the bathroom, and over here there's another door. So I took care of my business as a young Evanger male, and I was leaving the bathroom, and I, instead of going to this door, went to that door, which was a closet door, and I tried to open it, and it was locked. And I thought I was stuck in the bathroom, and I began to freak out. I began to lose my cool, and my onions began to boil, and, and I just began screaming uncontrollably. I was stuck in the bathroom. I was trapped. They'd forget about me. I'd grow old in the bathroom. Eventually, I was rescued, and I stand here today because of my rescuers which literally was somebody just walking into the bathroom themselves and looking at me and going, something wrong? <laughs> and I said, oh, no, and I walked out, okay? But it was a terrifying experience. <laughs> One of the greatest traumas of my life. Now let me tell you a second story about a young Evanger male. This is my three-year-old son, Grayson. And literally, God dropped this beautiful illustration into my lap on Friday morning. I was in a meeting, 
And so uh, I should have my phone always on me. My wife reminded me of that after this incident. But I didn't. My phone was in the car. And I got back, and I had eight missed calls from Grandma Evanger. That's my mother, who was watching Grayson. At our house, we live in this uh, older house built in 1927. They have these old doors with these old locks. And Grayson is learning to pot. He's potty training, and he likes to be in the bathroom by himself. So he had walked into the bathroom. He said, Grandma, privacy. He had closed the door, and for some reason, he decided this time he never had done it before. I'm going to lock the door. And so he locks himself in the bathroom. And I find this all out through a series of voicemails that I've gotten. <laughs> some starting a little bit panicked, then moving to more panicked, then moving to sheer terror, to finally... Um, I call my mother and she says, everything's all right. She says, Grayson locked himself in the bathroom. I tried to talk him out and teach him how to unlock the door himself, and he couldn't do it. So I called 911. <laughs> and the fire, firemen came. And the funniest part of the story is they said Grayson was standing with his toes right at the edge of the door so you could see his little toes hanging through. And it took quite some time to convince him to stand back because the firemen were going to break him out. And so the firemen come in with the crowbar and they jack up the door. They rip the door open and there Grayson is standing in the bathtub like this saying, Firemen! <laughs> and he was rescued. Love the fire department. Turns out you don't have to pay if the fire department comes. Thank you, taxpayers. Happy Labor Day. Okay. <laughs> So it's exciting. So me and my son now have this shared experience of being trapped in a bathroom, feeling as though our life uh, is at an end. Now, the problem that this book will address is like these bathrooms. Pause. <laughs> Let's try to figure it out. Everyone who is currently living today who was born in this country is born into a bathroom. We're born into it. We don't have a choice. We are born into the bathroom that the authors of this book call an American sickness. And it plagues all Americans on both sides of the political aisle, rich and poor, young and old, Christian, non-Christian. It plagues us all. We're all stuck into the bathroom. And the authors call this room radical individualism. And we didn't choose it. We didn't choose it, but we're all stuck in this room, and we all feel like we're locked in it. Now, some Americans are like old Evanger, and they already have the way out. It's already unlocked. They've experienced it. They just find themselves standing in the bathroom still, but all they have to do is find the door that's already open. It's already been opened to them. If they just take a step back and see things clearly... But some Americans are like young Evanger, and the door is locked, and they have no idea how to unlock it. And they need somebody to come and break down the door for them. So how did we get into this bathroom? I'm going to answer three questions. How did we get into the bathroom how do we help see what is the bathroom? And how do we help convince ourselves that we're in the bathroom or help others see that they're in the bathroom of radical individualism, which is an American sickness? And it's keeping us from the fullness of all we were created to be. And then the third thing is I'm going to say, how do we ourselves and how do we help others escape to find better freedom better meaning, better purpose for life. And that's really actually going to take us into the next three weeks. We won't get a ton into that tonight. i got to set up the bathroom, how we got in it, and then i got to set up how do we see that we're in it, and then we'll really spend the next three weeks answering how do we get out of it. How do we get out of it, okay? So how do we get into the bathroom? You guys ready for this? It's about to get academic. And if you like history, you're going to love this first question. Because we got into this bathroom all the way back when the first settlers came from Europe and landed uh, in the Massachusetts Bay, um, really that first Puritan settlement in Boston really was the beginning of this idea of individualism. 
Now, what we're going to see in all of these, where did it come from, all these source conversations, is that, for instance, the Puritans, it wasn't a sickness at this point. Because individualism is not in itself wrong. It's radical individualism that we see now in our society that is the problem. Being an individual is not bad. Taking responsibility for yourself is not bad. But when it becomes detached from true meaning and values of life, then it becomes a problem. So the Puritan settlements in Massachusetts, they really brought over this idea of we can create a city on a hill, is what they would say. And they get that from biblical language. A city on a hill. This is the first idea of a utopian society in which there is equality and freedom to pursue good. They would, they would say all human beings have natural liberty. And for them what freedom meant was moral freedom. Freedom to do what your conscience told you was right. And, and one of the primary mouthpieces of this was a guy named John Winthrop to give you some where are we at in, in human history. This is 1588 he lived to 1649. This is when he was living, John Winthrop, and he said this, any authority that violates this liberty, this natural liberty, is not true authority and must be resisted. Sound like Americans, right? It all began with the first settlers to the new world. Now, this idea gets transferred into the founding fathers. We're talking guys like Washington and Jefferson, John Adams. You heard about Benjamin Franklin? great craft store, also a great American patriot. <laughs> Some of you don't know about the great craft store that is Benjamin Franklin because you're not from around here. Look it up. So Jefferson becomes sort of like, um, we'll call him the poster boy of, of, of the founders, and he set forth this ideal of a self-governing government. And what he said is that self-governing societies of relative equals, this is the way of the future. This is the way government should be. This is not the way it had always been, if you're remembering back to your social studies classes. And Jefferson's living, living from 1743 to 1826. This idea is coupled with this other idea known, known as republicanism. And don't think like political party. Think like republicanism is always that every citizen participates in their society. That makes a society go. Everybody participating. Individual was never as important as the society in these transcendent ideals of the early republic. So Jefferson said things like this, love your neighbor as much as yourself and love your country even more than yourself. Okay? So there's always this idea, even though individualism, everybody was responsible for themselves, it was always for the greater good. Then Benjamin Franklin comes along and he is quint the quintessential self-made man. Uh, Benjamin Franklin's dad was a candle maker, and Benjamin Franklin grew for himself an immense wealth, an immense power in this new society, and of course was instrumental as a founding father. And, you know, it's interesting, you read about Benjamin Franklin, I don't remember all this stuff. He's the guy that came up when he wrote his book, his sort of autobiography, with uh, sayings like this, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man wealth, uh, healthy, wealthy, and wise. God helps those who help themselves. This is the American dream that has fallen down to us ever since Benjamin Franklin, the self-made man, meaning that anyone could, through hard work and personal effort, accomplish anything that their heart desired. And Ben Franklin was sort of the poster child. Now, um, 1819 to 1892, there was a group of guys that sort of revolted against what was happening in America, which is this idea that individualism led to personal wealth and accumulation, and they started to say, no, there's another more important part of life, and these were authors such as Walt Whitman. And Walt Whitman was saying things like, you know, it's not the accumulation of wealth or world of, of sort of material success that makes an individual pursuit healthy, it's something more. It's actually being everything you were created to be. It's this very expressive individualism. He would say, like, the freedom to express myself, my meanness, that is the meaning of life. And so in one of his famous poems called Leaves of Grass, the very first line of his poem is, I celebrate myself. These things sound familiar? They're not new, <laughs> Walt Whitman was pushing back against the materialism of Benjamin Franklin's 
self-made man, and he was saying, I'm a self-made man, but in a different way. I want to live in the woods, in a log cabin, with very little accoutrement. I want to celebrate myself and my meanness, okay? So this is the world in which you find yourself at the end of the 18th, uh, 1800s, and uh, there's a nice quote that we have that sort of sums up this kind of individualism that we find. So, oh man, that sun needs to go away, but hopefully you guys can read this. Throw it up here, Augusta. Uh, a guy named uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who's a Frenchman, love the French, um, came over and he observed this new experiment, which was the American Republic, okay? And I don't know if you guys can read this. He, he says, individualism is a calm and considered feeling which disposes each citizen to isolate himself from the mass of his fellows and to withdraw into the circle of family and friends. With this little society formed to his taste, he gladly leaves the greater society to look after itself. As democratic individualism grows, there are more and more people who, though neither rich nor powerful, have enough or enough to have much hold over others, have gained or kept enough wealth and enough understanding to look after their own needs. Such folk owe no man anything and hardly expect anything from anyone. They form the habit of thinking of themselves in isolation and imagine that their whole destiny is in their hands. Finally, such people come to forget their ancestors, but also their descendants, as well as isolating themselves from their contemporaries. Each man is forever thrown back on himself alone, and there is danger that he may be shut up in the solitude of his own heart. Published, what does that say there? Published 1835. Sound familiar? This individualism was there from the very beginning. We didn't choose to be in the bathroom. We were put there. And as you can imagine, things progressed more and more from even what this French sociologist was observing way back in 1835. This is crazy. Each person works for himself. That is the fundamental nature of individualism. Now, don't get me wrong. There's part of that that's very good. God has created us to work. God has created us to express ourselves and the uniqueness of who we are. But when it comes at the great cost of caring for your fellow man, something has gone awry. And it had begun to go awry even back in the early parts of our nation's history. Now, what the book will tell us and what it's important to understand is that the reason that it didn't spread to radical individualism because, was because of the power and the place of Christianity in our culture, and the ideas that Thomas Jefferson talked about of the love for the republic. And so these two big, powerful value systems sort of buffer this individualism so that we didn't give up on our fellow man, so that we didn't give up on our society, and our society continued to thrive, of course it has continued to thrive, for the next 100, 120 years from the time he wrote this, okay? But these uh, uh, you know, seedlings of ideas have continued to be the way we perceive ourselves as Americans. Whew. That's just one, three of many slides that I have. So we're going to keep moving here. So now how do we know that we're in the bathroom today <laughs> and how do we help somebody else realize that they're in this bathroom called individualism? I'm going to read now three uh, excerpts from four individuals that this book sort of follows along. They interviewed over 200 people for their study, and they found sort of four archetypes, four types of people that we find in our society, and so they found sort of the perfect archetypes, and so these are real people, and these are the real words that they have said regarding the way that they process and see the world. I just want you to know, this, this is what I want you to do as we're reading these. This is where I'm hoping it's helpful that we're developing a skill of how to listen well. And how we see, oh, I never would have thought what these people were saying was just an expression of radical individualism. But hopefully as we read it together, you can hear that that's actually what each of them are saying, even though they're coming from very different angles. And they themselves might not even realize they're just expressing their Americanism in their own unique way, okay? So here we go. The first guy I want to look at is a guy named Brian. His name's Brian Palmer. Can you guys see over here when I stand over here? Is this awkward? 
I've never done this before. Okay, Brian Palmer. Brian Palmer was a successful business manager at a high-tech company in Silicon Valley. Uh, he pursued his career above all else and achieved his financial and vocational goals. But after a failed marriage, he decided to change his single-minded devotion to his career to focus more on his children, his new wife, and his new and varied interests like classical music, books, and friendships. So here you've got a guy who in sort of the first half of his life pursues sort of the Benjamin Franklin version of individualism and he finds great success and he finds great wealth and he rises up in his career and then he determines that he's unfulfilled and he tries something else. So let's see this next slide here. This is um, Brian describing in his own words the reason for his change. He says this, well, I th now listen, listen to what he's saying. Well, I think I just reestablished my priorities. That exclusive pursuit of success now seems to me not a good way to live. That's not the most important thing to me. I have demonstrated to myself, to my own satisfaction, that I can achieve about what I want to achieve. So the challenge of goal realization does not contain that mystique that it held for me at one time. I just have found that I get a lot of personal reward from being involved in the lives of my children. Now, some analysis here. Because at first, right, we hear that we're like, that's good. We want fathers to be involved in the lives of their children. And if I'm having a conversation with Brian, you know what I might just say? That's awesome. I'm, I'm so glad you found a good, valuable meaning. And it is to spend time with your kids. But actually, think a little bit deeper about how he said what he said. Here's the analysis. In his description of his reason for changing his life and of his current happiness, it seems to come down mainly to a shift in his notions of what would make him happy. His new goal, devotion to marriage and his children, seems as arbitrary and unexamined as his earlier pursuit of material success. Both are justified as idiosyncratic preference rather than a representing of a larger sense of the purpose of life. Do you see what he's saying here? I agree that spending time with your children will bring you better, longer lasting, fuller happiness. But the reason he's pursuing it is still for himself because it makes him feel happy, because it makes him feel good more than what he found in his career success. Let's see another quote. He says this, Brian says this, this is his own words. I guess I feel like everybody on this planet is entitled to have a little bit of space, and things that detract from other people's space are kind of bad. One of the things uh, that is used to characterize life in California, one of the things that makes California such a pleasant place to live, as people by and large aren't bothered by other people's value systems, as long as they don't infringe upon your own. By and large, the rule of thumb out here is that if you've got money, honey, you can do your things as long as your thing doesn't destroy someone else's property or inter uh, interrupt their sleep or bother their privacy, then that's fine if you want to go in your own house and smoke marijuana and shoot dope and get all screwed up. That's your business. Don't bring that onto the street, though. Don't expose my children to it. Just do your thing. That works out kind of nice. You hear it? You hear that individualism? When Brian describes how he's chosen to live, what he's shown is that what is good is what one finds rewarding. If one's preferences change, so does the nature of the good. Even the deepest ethical virtues are justified as matter of personal preference. Indeed, the ultimate ethical rule is simply that individuals should be able to pursue whatever they find rewarding, constrained only by the requirement that they not interfere with the value systems of others. Sound familiar? Now here's the radical wild thing. This book was first published in 1985. You think it's gotten more or less like this? <sighs> okay, what do we got next here, Augusta? That's the classic... Didn't find happiness in business. He pursued his individual success and money, and now he's pursuing something new. But they are both <clears throat> individualistic pursuits of what makes him feel reward. The second character is Joe Gorman. And Joe is a corporate PR specialist who lives in a small town outside of Boston. And in every way, he seems different than Brian. The things he cares about are not money, success. And he cares about community. 
Joe lives where he grew up, and he holds on uh, dearly to traditions of his family and his historic community. In fact, he heads up the 250th anniversary celebration of his small town as a volunteer. Joe, for Joe, success means achieving the goals set for you by your family and community, not using your family and community to, to achieve your individual goals. You see how this feels different? Like, you could just be talking to Joe, and you're like, oh, I'm so glad you're not like Brian. You're so different. You care about the community. That's so wonderful. Let's, let's hear some of the things that Joe says. He says this, we are, we are doing it together. It is so important to work to get as many people as possible active. I mean, I'm reading this, I'm like, I'm hearing myself. Speaking of his town celebration, he said this, you know, for me, the best time of the whole celebration was standing back there behind the bleachers after the softball games with members of the families that had played and talking with them about their families and drinking champagne. That, to me, is the ultimate. The whole series of anniversary celebrations was so successful that the first thing people said after it was over was, was this, why can't we do this every year? Okay, are you, wait, are you listening? He's just like Brian. He just cares about something different. He feels reward when, when he experiences togetherness. But you see how it's how he feels. When people say to him, why don't we do this every year? He feels good about himself. For Joe, success relates to the experience of togetherness the community has created, particularly through his efforts. This is how Joe found personal satisfaction. But it's still an individualistic idea of personal satisfaction. Only for Joe, his satisfaction is found differently than Brian's. Joe's nostalgic desire to return to the mythical past provides little help in understanding how his town might work out of the contemporary problems they have and almost no framework for thinking about how his town fits into the larger context of the society as a whole. You see? You see how it's still bankrupt? Because it's all about how Joe feels. So as long as he feels good about the things he's doing, even though it looks so different, it's still individualism. Okay, here's our third character. Her name is Margaret Oldham, and she's a therapist who was raised in a stable, solidly middle-class home. But Margaret would uh, nonetheless say that Joe's nostalgic concept of the well-lived life is unrealistic and fails to take account of the realities of human nature and modern social life. Margaret believes that people vary tremendously in their values and experience, and, and all you do if you stick rigidly to your own standards is cut yourself off from others. Tolerance for others and a willingness to learn from new experiences are important. The tightly knit, homogenous community Joe longs for to recreate would make Margaret uh, claustrophobic and ultimately would be too demanding for her. She places individual fulfillment higher than achievement to family and community. So you see? Oh man, she's totally different than Joe. She's totally different from Joe. Let's hear what she says. She says, don't just work, but take pride in your work and be responsible for your work and do it as well as you possibly can and do a lot of it. Do it with a lot of respect for other people and their property and their rights. This sounds good. I'm with Margaret at this point. I'm like, I like that, being from Seattle. I'm all about that. Now here's what she says. I don't think it's important to be, uh, to be quite that moralistic, quite that rigid. I think that I accept people the way they are more than either of my parents have ever been able to do. I got into psychology mostly because I was just really curious about people and what made them tick. And I was interested in why people do the things that they did and why they didn't have the same ideas that I did. I had a lot of friends who were, are intelligent people who are flunking out of school and getting into a lot of trouble, and I always wondered why. What was the motivation? What was causing them to make the kinds of decisions that they made in their lives, right? Are you listening? At first we could say, oh, that's good stuff. And it is. But what is she talking about? Herself. This interests her. This fulfills her to learn about other people. To be honest, if she was my therapist, I'd be freaked out. Because she cares more about how it makes her feel. If you're any kind of therapist at all, Margaret says, you're out there on the line all the time and you learn things from all your clients and you grow a lot yourself. Doing therapy is almost as good for me as it is for my clients, so I get a lot out of that sort of reward. I think just being exposed to different people's thoughts and ideas and problems and finding out, you know, what their lives are like just sort of opens up new kinds of ideas. Every time I get a client, uh, every time I got a new client for a while, I would totally rethink my view of the world because the client could come with all these different ideas and sort, um, 
uh, and, sort, and sort of innocently challenge things that I consider to be very basic in life, and I have to go home and think about it for a while. You see this? Are you, are you li- I mean, see, it's hard to hear. You've got to practice this. She's just talking about all the ways it fulfills her. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with uh, psychology or therapy or being a counselor. Those are wonderful things. It's just her way of viewing why she loves her job. It's all about her. I just sort of accept the way the world is and don't think about a lot about it. I tend to operate on the assumption that what I want to do and what I feel like is what I should do. But I think universe wants me to make my values, whatever they might happen to be, and live up to them as much as I can. If I'm the best person I know how to be according to my lights, then something good will happen. I think in a lot of ways, that kind of life is its own reward in and of itself. You hear it? Reward, reward, personal satisfaction. Okay, we're going to skip this last quote and go to the last character. Actually, let's see that analysis real quick. Um, So for Margaret, she has deep self-knowledge, wide tolerance of differences among people, and a very mature willingness to accept responsibility for her own life, which is all good. She too is caught, but she's caught in some sort of contradiction that her beliefs imply. She is responsible for herself, but she has no reliable way to connect her own fulfillment to that of other people, whether they be her own husband and children or the larger society and political community of which she is inevitably a part. I think there's an issue in that. Okay, final guy is a guy named Wayne Bauer. He lives in Santa Monica, California, and uh, we're going to fly through him. He's a community organizer, and he works um, for tenants, uh, primarily immigrant tenants, with landlords to try to help uh, the tenants. Uh, Here's some things that Wayne says. He talks about his time during the 60s. He saw a dream, a vision, a better way to live of personal growth as well as political change. We wanted something better for himself, and so he talks how he actually went from the Marine Corps to to kind of following political activism. Uh, Let's skip to the next quote here, Augusta. And um, in 1965, when NYU marched and burned the draft cards, all of a sudden, there was political awareness. And he talks about in himself, um, everything broke apart, everything shattered, all these beliefs. And this is a common theme that you hear in individualism, is that I was raised this way, or my family was this way, and then it was shattered, and I rethought everything for myself, and now I've recreated a new thing for me. Next quote here, Augusta. He said, I had to make a break from my past. Morality became a question to me. It's sort of like I wanted to put everything back together again with a more durable material, one that would stand the strain. Political activism became that durable material. Watching politics, watching uh, civilization struggle and evolve, that's very exciting. But it's always much more personal because it's your struggle to evolve into this picture. It's the historic picture somehow. You hear the durable material for him though very different than Brian's or Margaret's or Joe's, is political activism. For him, that's what makes him feel alive. That's what excites him. That struggle, that being against something, is how he finds his meaning. Let's keep going here. So you see you have four individuals that all feel very, very different. When you were, if you were just in conversation with them, you'd be like, oh, these are totally different people. But as you look closely and you listen closely and you ask good questions, what you realize is that they're all driven by that same radical individualism. They're all locked in that room where they can only think about the world in terms of what fulfills them and gives them meaning. They're all stuck there. For some, like Brian and Margaret, they're more concerned about their private lives. For others, like Joe and Wayne, they're more concerned about public life. But it's individualism. Now, remember, this is written 1985. I was born in 1982. These are my parents. These are your parents. Guess what they passed down to their children? An even more radical version than they themselves we're experiencing. And so while Joe, Brian, Margaret, Wayne, all are very different people, they're unique individuals, and that's good, and we celebrate that, and we want them to be unique, they do share a vocabulary of arbitrary goals for the good life, goals that bring satisfaction to them personally. And they also share, unfortunately, a confusion about how to define the nature of success the meaning of freedom, and the requirements of justice 
because unlike the founding fathers, they find themselves in a form of individualism that is untethered from biblical or Republican ideas that were always buffering the early American people. Those have been stripped away, and it's the Wild West, so to speak, of individualism. And here's the result. Let's see this quote here, Augusta. Okay, here's the result. The center of life is the autonomous individual, presumed able to choose the roles he or she will play and the commitments he or she will make, not on the basis of higher truths, but according to criterion of life effectiveness as the individual judges it. That's it. Next slide. In its own understanding, the expressive aspect of our culture exists for the liberation and fulfillment of the individual. Its genius is that it it enables the individual to think of commitments from marriage and work to political and religious involvement as enhancements of of this sense of individual uh, well-being rather than as moral imperatives. And we'll spend the next three weeks trying to break down why that is. Does that make sense? They are enhancements. So maybe you're at church today and you're like, this is an enhancement for me. It's not a moral imperative. It's not like the Puritans thought about it. It's not like Thomas Jefferson thought about political involvement. Maybe you're very involved politically. But it's an enhancement, not an imperative. This is the world we find ourselves in. This is the bathroom that we're all locked in. So how do we ourselves and how do we help others escape? Because we believe outside of this room of radical individualism is more and better freedom. See, we feel like we have freedom, but we're trapped. Outside of this room is more and better meaning. We feel like we have meaning, but we're limited. There's walls all around us. And the answer, and this is where it gets really simple, but really complex, and why we have three more weeks to unpack it, the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we will unpack, because Jesus says, and the Bible teaches us, that if you want to find your life, you must lose your life for Christ's sake. Jesus said that. The gospel teaches us, the Bible teaches us, that to die is gain, and to live is not David, to live is Christ. The gospel teaches us, the Bible teaches us, that we are individuals and we worship an individual God in three persons who came in the flesh and dwelt among us, who was himself, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, an individual. So the individual is not bad, but we are individuals who are all together a part of one body. And that when each and every part of the body works together, the fullness of all that God has created and designed and planned comes to fruition. If one suffers, the Bible tells us, all suffer. No one is dispensable in the body of Christ. And in fact, those who the world perceives as least in the body of Christ are most honored. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The gospel and understanding it rightly, not understanding it through the lens of American individualism, but understanding the Bible as itself, as it was given to us by the mouth of God, will free us from this American sickness. I've experienced it in part in my own life, and I'm still fighting against it because I didn't choose, but I was born into it, and I excelled in it. This system that I was born in, I won the game. And so I'm fighting against it by understanding more deeply the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think we have a quote up here, Augusta, from Elizabeth Elliot. Well, let's read this one from Charles Taylor. (laughs) One central uh, constituent of Christian revelation is that God not only wills our good, so it's important to understand that gospel teaches God wants our good, a good which includes human flourishing, but... He was willing to go to extraordinary lengths to ensure this in the becoming human and the suffering of his son. 
Like Jesus, we too are free to deprive ourselves so another might flourish. The exact opposite of radical individualism. Okay, go through this. How do we escape the bathroom? Great question. Keep going. Do we have another one after this? No, keep going. (laughs) Okay, okay, that's it. I don't have it. So I'm going to read to you (laughs) a quote by Elizabeth Elliot. And I think it's beautiful. We'll just end with this. She asks us a question. Does your faith rest in having your prayers answered as you think they should be answered by God? That's individualism. Or does it rest on that mighty love that went down into death for us? Oftentimes, she says, we can't tell where it actually rests. In American individualism or in faith in the mighty love of Jesus Christ. But she says, you can tell once you find yourself in real trouble. So part of our job to make better conversation is to help people see that they're in real trouble. That they are being limited for all God has designed them to be because they have chosen to stay whether the door's unlocked or not for them, whether they know the way out, they are trapped in something they didn't choose to start in. But we can help them find their way out. Let's pray. Father God, this is heavy, heady, perhaps difficult to understand material. So I pray that by your spirit, because we know your spirit can make anything understandable, that you would help us to understand these truths, that you would help us to understand the world that we live in, that you would help us to understand the people that we are, not always by choice, but often just because we grew up in this country. God, that we would, in one sense, value and appreciate the individual, but always call them to something greater to the brotherhood and the sisterhood of Christ Jesus, into the family of God, to be missionaries and doers of good in the larger society in which we live, that the love of Christ compels us to not remain thinking only of ourselves or only of our own church, but to move outward and press beyond that we might bless each and every individual in our city by bringing to them the power and the presence of Jesus Christ through his spirit in acts of kindness, acts of love, acts of surrender and sacrifice. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ who died for our sin and rose from the grave to prove that it is finished and it is possible to move forward. To his name we pray. Amen.